Thank you so much, praise team, for leading us. Powerful moments of worship together this morning. Take your Bibles, if you will. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so buckle your chair belt that you have located to your left and your right and buckle it in. And we're going to ride through this. There's a lot here. We're going to get very practical, going to get very down to where the nitty gritty is and talk about these back to the basics, right? We talked about last week this incredible call. The thing that's most important, the thing that we need to do over and over and over again is our tendency to yawn at them, to quickly forget them. And folks, let me just remind you, if we lose here at the basics, we lose the game. And folks, in the reality, I told our folks Wednesday night, I told our folks Wednesday night that the reality is that we're in a battle for life. Seniors, just be reminded that when you, your senior year this year, and the urgency of our youth and children's ministry, that when you walk across that stage with that bunch of people in May, that 90 to 95% of those who have not yet professed, professed their faith in Jesus Christ They will never do so. That is a valid statistic, 90 to 95%. Folks, we're not just in this for a, a, this is life or death. Are Are you with me? This weekend in my heart and mind with some of these families, for some of these would be an encounter with the living Christ through a caring set of hands, through the hands of a dentist, through the smile of a greeter, through a new pair of tennis shoes for a child who hasn't had one before, through the giving of a food backpack for a child who just might go hungry over the weekend. We have an opportunity to do the basics that matter for life. The basics, though, we, we tend to kind of let them go. But if we want to be the difference makers that Christ has intended for us to be, if we want to make an eternal impact that will outlast us, then we must be certain to be on top of the basics. The basics, we talked about on that logo, Michael, if you happen to have a chance to pull it up. We kind of talk about it from our church's standpoint, but from a standpoint for you and I as well, is this, these four images here. Our vision is engaging people with the hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. So no matter what we do inside these four walls, or what we do at 311 weekend, or what we do in mission trips, or what we do in committing our time and our resources, serving in the body of Christ, all of this designed to fulfill one call to engage people with the hope Hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. And how do we want to see that transformation happen? What does that transformation look like in your life and in mine? Well, it looks very simply, this connect, grow, commit, and go. These four key words, they really help us think through where are you on the journey. Last week, we talked about connecting. Connecting with Christ. Connecting with, uh, your, your, with your family. Connecting with your church family. Connecting with those, your friends, those that love you and hold you accountable. Connecting with those who are far away from God. And there's some of you who would say this morning, I don't know anybody who's lost. Well, can I encourage you? If you'll come this weekend, you'll have an opportunity to encourage some that are lost. Who don't know Christ. I always laughingly tell our dentist, you'll have a captive audience for 40 minutes with that mouth wide open. Where's Dr. Kelly? I saw Shane. Where are you at, Amy? Are you here in here somewhere? Just you're here. Um, oh, she's taking care of Isla. Oh, Isla's still sick. Bless her heart. Um, you can tell her. I love when dentists, this is my favorite thing dentists do, which is one of the reasons I've not been a dentist in a really long time. And um, they, they want to ask you, well, this is my favorite thing. So how's, how's the family? How are you? I love the son of dog. You're doing great, right? You can't talk back to them when they're asking you questions. So a great opportunity to share the gospel. But as they're sitting there waiting and they're nervous. Anybody nervous when you go to the dentist? Anybody raise your hand if you're nervous, right? I'm so nervous, I don't go to the dentist. I'm so nervous. I thank God for medicated dentistry. Valium, that's what I, I believe in that one moment, so I don't, I don't care to go sit in that dentist chair. Right? So there are people going to be nervous. Here's what I'm going to ask them. Is there anything I can pray with you about? There's not a single person in this room that cannot look at somebody else and say, can I pray with you about something? And I have yet to encounter a single person that said to me, don't you dare pray for me. I don't have a single thing you can pray for me about. Every person has something that they want somebody to pray with them about. And if nothing else, pray they want. They're scared going to sit in the dentist chair. We've got some primary school students who may have never sat in the dentist chair who are scared. So we have an opportunity to make a difference. To connect. Uh, Shano, just to not to pick on the Kelly family, I just want to quote this, this statement he said in Deacon's meeting Sunday. He's been on my heart all week long. Here's what he said. 
He said there is a difference between going to a church and being a part of a church. There's a huge difference. And there are some of you in this room, and I love you deeply, and I'm glad you're here, and I hope you'll keep on coming. But some of you, you simply just come to church. But church is not something to come to. Church is something to be a part of. It is a living, breathing organism that is designed to impact this lost and dying world. In order for us to do that, we have to be connected Connected to Christ, connected to the church, connected to your family, connected to deep friends who will encourage you, and connected to those who are far away from God. How do we do that? How do we get back to those basics? Very quickly, we talked about these last week. We're going to mention these all four of our messages together. We have to have a deep desire. We've got to want to grow. We've got to want to connect. We've got to be deliberate, to be intentional about what we're doing. You won't do the basics without a plan. You've got to know your design and have a design. Know who God made you to be and how you can execute that design that God has put you in. You got to be desperately dependent. You've got to be dedicated and determined to not quit when times get tough. And if you miss a day on a quiet time, then, well, it doesn't really matter. I'll just miss the next couple of weeks. No, get back on track. We must declare our sins, confess and repent. And for many of us, in order to do that which Christ has called us to do, we've got to divest ourselves of distractions. There's some of us who we've got a lot of stuff in our lives. We've got a lot of activities, a lot of stuff. And nothing wrong with having things in our lives. But here's my question. In trying to balance all those, are you investing in anything in your life that is eternal, that will last? So we talked about connect. This morning we're going to talk about the call to grow deeper. The statement that we say is grow in a deepening relationship with Christ. Connect yourself and others to Christ and his church grow in a deepening relationship with Jesus Christ. We often assume this, but the problem is in our day and age and culture in which we live, we cannot assume that people grow. We are raising biblically illiterate and have raised biblically illiterate generations of people who do not know what the word of God is. They do not know how to read it. They do not know how to apply it to their lives. They depend upon a preacher to tell them everything they know about the word of God. And our challenge, our call, our, our desire is that you would be able to feed yourself and grow on your own. And yes, hear the word of God. That's a part of it. And yes, being a life group, that's a part of it. But that you would grow in maturing Christ. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 says. Some strong words from, uh, we think maybe the apostle Paul, not sure of the author of Hebrews. Listen to what he says. And I'm going to read a couple other scriptures in, in some different translations to help you think through these verses. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ... Let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instructions about washing and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we shall do if God permits. Let me read that from two other translations to help you think about that. From, listen to what it says here. This is from the Living Bible. Let us stop going over the same old ground again and again, always teaching those first lessons about Christ. Let us go on instead to other things and become mature in our understanding as strong Christians ought to be. Surely, we don't need to speak further about the foolishness of trying to be saved by being good or about the necessity of faith in God. You don't need further instructions about baptism and spiritual gifts and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. The Lord willing... We will go on to other new things. The message, a very modern day translation. That was from the Living Bible. This is what the message says. I love this. So come on. Let's leave the preschool finger painting exercises on Christ and get on with the grand work of art. Grow up in Christ. The basic, basic foundational truths are in place. Turning your back on salvation by self-help and turning in trust towards God. Baptismal instructions, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. God helping us, we'll stay true to all that. But there's so much more. I love this. Let's get on with it. You can ever go to a place where you're just kind of bored. You just have to sit through a conference and you go through all the preliminaries. Man, I go through places. We go to conferences around here and somebody will talk about this and um, well, every time we go to, I'm not knocking my friends at William Carey, but every time I go to William Carey, I have to hear all about the, way, the latest and greatest at William Carey. I, I, I love that, and I love William Carey, and I love our kids that go to William Carey. It's fantastic. When I came there, though, I wanted to hear, so I got to hear Dr. Jim Shaddix back in the spring of this last year. I love Dr. Man, I, I'm thinking to myself, you are wasting precious time from Jim Shaddix. 
I didn't really come to hear you talk about it. Let's get on with it. Some of us need that encouragement to get on with our spiritual growth. That encouragement, that fire to be lit underneath our spiritual blessed assurance to get moving and growing in our walk with the Lord. Listen to other verses together. Do you have Colossians there? Um, Michael, I don't know if you have those or not. I'm not sure. Yeah, Colossians 2, 6 or 7. Listen to what this says. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Be, having been firmly rooted now, rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Another version says it this way, let your roots grow down deep into him and draw up nourishment from him. See that you go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Let your lives overflow with joy and thanksgiving for all he has done. Uh, the next translation, their sinful minds have made them proud. Uh, Colossians 2, let me go to the next one too, um, here. Colossians 2, uh, 18 and 19. Uh, See that no one takes you captive through philosophy or empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary pr- principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. 8 through 19. I need 18. She missed that verse. Skip to 18 if you will. I'm like, that is not what I need. I know you're going to find 18. There it is. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize. There are many Christians who are being defrauded of the prize. My delighting in self-abasement, the worship of angels, taking a stand on visions he has seen, infatuated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head. Who? Christ. From whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joint and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. Another one in Ephesians just talks about this truth. Here it is. It's time for some of us or all of us to grow up. If a doctor came to you and said to you, about your child, you went to an appointment, and some of you have experienced this before, your child is not growing. You would be alarmed. Now, for us, we had a little baby Emma, and so we know that she's a preemie, so she, when the very first time, she, she was not on the growth chart her entire first year of life. I mean, she wasn't even on it, right? Like, like not even like 1% on the growth chart. Like, she ruins the chart for everybody, for everybody else, all right? So my other kids are on there for, you know, 15 or 25 or whatever. They're short like me, and, and, uh, and so... so we, one, one day we finally, we got, it was like a huge day. We went and celebrated. We we're on the growth chart. We we're like 3% on the growth chart. We're like, woohoo, right? Now, we're watching her carefully to make sure she makes those marks in her physical growth. Now, listen to me carefully. This is going to be an important word, moms and dads. If that doctor looked at you and said, listen, they're not making the physical growth they need to make. We need to do something about it. And you simply said, all right, we'll do something next time. We'll come back in a year and we'll think about it. No, what are you going to do? You're going you're gonna to have that conversation. Some of you are going to go get on Google.com and Google growth and growth charts and what is the next step to do to help your child grow, right? You're going to do everything you can. Take it into other avenues of our lives. We help our kids excel in sports and excel in cheerleading or band or whatever those activities may be. And we Google things on how to help them be a better this or better that and help them get extra practice. And we do this and we do that. Here's my question. What are you doing, moms and dads, for their spiritual growth? What are you doing for your spiritual growth? Now, it's going to get quiet in here. When, when, when uh, the guy came, and I can't think of his name, except that he's from Mississippi State, and that's where I try to forget his name for that reason. But um, the guy that came from Mississippi State, Barbara, um, that uh, says chaplain of Mississippi State bas- baseball team. Matt Jolly, thank you, Dana. Matt Jolly came and said a statement that I already knew, but it just, boy, I, I, it's right there, right in between the eyeballs. He said this, moms and dads, I knew it, but it just didn't hit me in this way. You are the primary disciplers of your children. And too often we're guilty, like we drop them off at school, right? And they go into school, and Dr. Dillett said, well, we were high-fiving as they go into school, right? And we say, help them learn. Sometimes we do the same thing with the church. Here's my child. You raised them up. You fixed them. As a youth minister, I had many parents. You got to fix my child. You gotta fix my child. Here's the kicker. We, as moms and dads, as grandparents, as men and women of God, must be growing on our own so that we in turn can help our kids grow. 
And here's what I want you to be. I want you to be the place, church. Listen to me carefully. Listen to my heart. Where you are just as concerned about their spiritual growth as you are their physical growth. Where are they on the spiritual growth chart? One of the reasons that we went several years ago on Wednesday nights to the curriculum that we are using. It's kind of old school in some ways. Now, the curriculum is fantastic, but it's, and the title of it is Bible Drill, Thrills, and Skills. They had Bible drill when I was in elementary school. But here's what we discovered years ago. Our kids don't know the basic Bible stories, and they don't know anything hardly about their Bible. So we made a commitment that on those Wednesday nights, we were going to do that. And some, they have so much fun, half of them don't even realize. Kids, we're just letting you know, you don't realize it. You are learning the truths of the Word of God in a really fun way. We're doing that intentionally. It's not accidental. That is intentional. So we're sending forms home for you every single month for you to look at and know what they're learning so you can encourage them and help them in that so that they are growing deep spiritually. Just some thoughts on, about growing Here's the great news. The Lord loves us right where we are. Someone say, well, I'm, I'm kind of on the elementary truths of the word of God right now. That's okay. We are all going to be there at some point in our lives. The challenges don't stay there. Some of you this morning, you've been a believer for 20 years, but you are no further down the road of growth than you were last year or 10 years ago. The challenge, the call, the encouragement, the, the, the loving, encouraging words to you is, let's get on with it. Let's grow up in a deep relationship with Christ. But he loves us. Though he he loves us right where we are, he also loves us enough to not allow us to be content with where we are. He puts that sense of unsettledness inside of us. We call it a holy discontent. I'm content knowing I'm loved by the Father, but I have a holy discontent because I'm not where I need to be yet. I'm loved the whole way through. Notice this too. This is going to be really, really life-changing right here. Healthy things grow. Right, Sarah, when I order flowers from you, if you sent me a, 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 a bouquet of flowers to my wife, which she's done before beautifully, and I send them to my wife, and you send me dead flowers. Now listen, flowers are going to die eventually. There's no question about that. But... We're going to have a conversation, aren't we? Well, they're healthy flowers. They were healthy when they left my store. Well, they're not healthy now. Now, that's never happened. Now, they were all beautiful. I encourage you to use your floor shop. But I am saying, if you sent me flowers or anybody else sent me flowers and they were dead, I wouldn't be impressed. Healthy things grow. So if you are in your walk with the Lord and you're not growing, then you're not healthy. That's why a church that is not growing is not healthy. Are numbers everything? Absolutely not. Do I like to look at numbers? I do. I like to track and see and try to figure out why and where and when and how we can improve and do better in what we're doing and see season where dips, what can we do differently? Here's what I know. If a church is not growing, there is something not right. Doesn't have to grow exponentially. Doesn't have to grow. And we're being blessed every single year. God continues to grow. We'll grow probably around 8% from last year to this year. That's awesome, incredible, worth celebrating and rejoicing over. Healthy things grow. So is it true in your own spiritual life. God designed us to grow deeper. We as a church want to grow wider, and God has done that. But at the same time, God always wants to grow us deeper. The goal of growth is what? We read it. It is to be mature in Christ, to be more like him. That's it. We want people to be able to look at us and say, hey, you live your life a lot like Jesus would. I see Jesus in you. That's what we want. We want to be mature. Now, are we ever going to get there? No, not on this side, but we get to heaven, we'll be like him. The Lord gives the growth. Our job is to put ourselves in a place where he can grow us. It's the illustration I've used a couple times this week. I think I even said it last Sunday, but I want to say it again. It's worth repeating. We go out here on this field out here, and we're going to plant some stuff out here. And God provides the sun, the soil, the ground, the nutrients inside of that soil, all the, the rain, everything that it needs, right? But I've never seen a field plow itself. I've got to get out there with a tractor and in the old days, a mule, and plow that field and put those seeds in and watch, watch. The roots grow deep. 
My heart's desire is that you would put yourself in a place where your roots could go deeper and deeper. How do we do that? I'm going to get really practical for a few minutes. So here they are. Are you ready? Number one, notice on your outline. You need to do these, what are there, four things every week and even for some of these daily. Number one, a daily time alone with the Lord. A daily time alone with the Lord. That seems to go without saying. You've heard them called a quiet time. Why do we call it quiet? So you need to be quiet when you're having this time. But a time alone with the Lord. Now, several things. How do you do that? What do you do? You need to have a predetermined time and place. For some of you like me, I can wake up at 5 o'clock and I'm good to go. My brain shuts off for me because I'm not a night owl. Some of your brain shuts on at 8 o'clock. Mine, it is on the fade quickly, very quickly. I will probably be unconscious by 9.15. It's a good possibility, especially in the school year, right? For some of you, you're going, 9.15, good night, preacher. I mean, what are you, 12? You're going to bed at 9.15? I mean, good night. I'm just now starting to get rolling. About to have a cup of coffee. I'll be up till about 1. Well, praise God for you. I'll pray for you while I'm asleep, or I'll pray for you when I'm up at 5 o'clock while you're still sleeping, right? We're all different. When you're in school sometimes, you may not, you may to after, after school may be your prime time. But find a time and a place that works for you, and a place you can be uninterrupted, and so as my kids have gotten older, I've learned I have to get up earlier and earlier, it seems, to beat them up. Because if I don't beat them up, that sounds good. Beat them from waking up. I think about that from time to time. But um, that's not what I meant, to, to beat them getting up in the morning, right? Um, I want to have that time alone uninterrupted because I am ADD. I don't need any distractions. I can create plenty by myself. But at 5 o'clock in the morning, there are none in my house. Time alone with the Lord. you got to have to come prepared. When we come to a time of worship or a time of Bible study, a time of alone with the Lord, we need to come with this mindset of being prepared, saying, God, I want you to speak to me. God, I know, listen to me. God, I know you're going to speak to me. Not going, oh, Lord, i got to read the word. I hope I get something out of it. No, no, no. God will speak to you. you got to come prepared, ready. God, speak to me. Third, you got to have a path. How do, you, how do you do it? Do you do the thumb method or the finger flipping method where you go to a scripture and read it? You need to have a plan. You got, you got to have a plan. I think we're on the third one there. You need to come prepared. Is that second one? You have a path, rather. A Bible reading plan. You can read to the Bible. I'm going to encourage you. We're going to, some other tools you can use, but in particular, you need to read through the Bible. You can do it all kinds of ways. You can read straight from Genesis all the way to the end, taking your time, reading a chapter a day, two chapters a day. Don't get gung-ho today, by the way, and go, I'm going to read 10 chapters a day. No, don't do that because you won't last very long. A chapter a day is plenty, two or three chapters maybe, if you're trying to read through the Bible in a year. You can read through it chronologically. There are great resources, Bibles that are laid out that way. On that Bible app, on your phone or your, your iPad or Kindle or whatever device you have that works, it'll lay it out for you on that little Kindle deal or on that, on that, on that technology. It'll lay it out for you. To, to, it's simple, right? You can read through a, a, um, a book at a time. Sometimes when I'm doing my quiet time, if I'm not reading chronologically through the Bible, I'll just go and I'll say, you know what, I'm going to park in 1 Corinthians and I'm just going to read it until I get through with it. And as God speaks to me, some days it's four verses and some days it's 12 verses, right? So it just depends on where I am and what I need, but I'm going to read through the word of God. I've got to have a plan. So again, when you get up in the morning, I don't know what to read. What do I read? All kinds of ways. Read a proverb a day. Read a psalm a day. Read a chapter out of the New Testament a day. Whatever it is, find a spot and begin the word of God. Fourthly, you need a plan. So when you do read the Bible, what do you do? Two different methods you can use. That you can use, and I, I don't have time to roll through all this. I've, all the notes will be on the website. You can take time to do this, but I'm giving you a lot of information this morning that's very practical, all right? You can use one of two methods or multiple methods in order to read the Word of God. So some people ask me, well, what do you do when you go to the Bible? How do you read it? Here's a way to do it. A SOAP method, S-O-A-P. You bring your scripture. You've got that plan, right? You've got the path. You read that scripture that God is before you. The Lord will direct your attention to some specific verses. Observe what you see. What is God showing you in a passage? Jot down some things on a journal, things that stand out. Are there truths that God wants you to learn? Are there warning? Are there commands? Are there guiding principles? Record them what God is, your message that God is speaking to you. So when I go to a passage, for example, like James chapter 1, and it says in James chapter 1, Now consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith will produce endurance, let endurance have its perfect result and you, you will be complete, lacking in nothing. When I go to a scripture like that, I'm saying this when I go to the scripture. What is God saying to me? 
Now, this is what God's saying to my friends. Now, as a preacher, I have to really guard myself because I go and read a scripture. I'll go, oh, I need to preach that. Oh, that'll preach right there. I can think of some folks who need to hear that word. I have to go shut that out just for me. What is God saying to me? So when I read those verses, when I encounter various trials, so I know that I'm going to encounter them and maybe what trials am I in right now? Or maybe I think about trials I've been in the past or that I might be in the future. And I'll ask myself this question, have I considered it all joy? And if I haven't, why haven't I? And what were the results of those things? What I want you to see is you personalize the scripture. That next one is apply. You personalize, what does it mean to you? How do you apply it to your day? So when you read a story like Noah, what in the world with Noah's Ark? Of course, it seems kind of fortunate down here in South Louisiana right now. But but what does that have to do with you going to work tomorrow? How does Noah apply to your life? So I'm reading for application, not just for information. God doesn't want you to know just about the Bible. He wants you to know the God of the Bible. So apply it and then pray. You can even pray the scripture that you read back to the Lord, but pray through what you've read. Another way to do it is you're reading. Look for things like this. Space is another acronym you can use. Is there a sin to confess in what you read? Is there a promise to claim? Is there an attitude to change? Is there a command to keep? Is there error to avoid? And is there something to thank God for? Right? So as I'm reading the word of God, I have a journal, right? Because I had to write stuff down. Now, here's the great news about it. Not only can you not read it, I usually can't read it. So my journals are safe. I have, I mean, I have just tons of, I, I used to use a little three ring, I mean, a spiral bound uh, journal, but now I use this notepad so I can write. And I journal, I write. I don't want everybody to read those journals because, buddy, they are personal. I got some serious stuff in there. I mean, I get real with the Lord when I'm writing stuff down because I need to write it down because if I just do it just kind of in my mind, my mind is, even when I write it down, my mind is going to go all over creation. It'll go over what I need to do for the day. It'll go over what I didn't do yesterday. It'll think about this or that or the other. And I want to be so zoned in to what God is speaking to me about. And so I'm thinking about these things as I encounter the word of God, thanking God. Lord, I need to confess it. I'm not doing that in my life, but I need to. Here's some specific ways I need to do that. So I'm journaling as I go through. Much more we could say about this, what it gives you there. Notice the next thing. We need the right tools. Find a translation of a Bible you can read. Now, I know some of you that are older, you have the King James Version. That is certainly fine. There's nothing wrong with the King James. Now, there are some who say the King James is the only Bible you can use. And I would completely, 100%, kindly, sweetly, and gently say, no way, Jose. That's not right. Jesus did not speak in King James English. He spoke in Aramaic. Now, the Bible, the New Testament, is written in Greek. There are Aramaic phrases throughout it. Jesus probably also could have spoken Greek. But Aramaic was the language there. So he didn't speak in 1600s in King James English. You need to find a translation. So for most people in our English language today, there are lots of words in there that we do not use anymore. And so if I use the King James English to preach from, I would spend the bulk of my time trying to explain what the words were that I read out of the Bible. Now, if it works for you, listen to me carefully. If it works for you, then use it. In my last church, I used the New King James that I preached out of because the vast majority of my congregation used the King James Version. Now, me, I preached out of the New American Standard Bible. For me, this is a Bible that works best for me. I believe it's the best translation. It's the most literal translation. I like it. But there are other translations you can use. The ESV, the Holman Christian Standard. If you use the NIV, be careful. Be careful. You need, if you use an NIV and all of our kids' Bibles we're giving, we're having to go back. They, do not, they no longer produce what, in my mind, was the only good NIV version, which was produced in 1984. I like the NIV. Nothing wrong with it. I often laughingly call it the nearly infallible version of Scripture, but it's good. A lot of you have the NIV. My encouragement is to you, don't buy 2,000 and past NIV translations because they're not good. They have, a lot of it, they have neutered God in that translation. Uh, they, there is a TNIV version, which you can hardly get now. Thank goodness it was just really a, not a good translation. But the NIV is a good one from the 84 translation. There are some other translations which I read from. The Message, the New Living Translation. You can use those alongside your Bible. I wouldn't encourage you to make that because they're more of a paraphrase, uh, more of a modern day translation, if you will. New American Standard, an older version of NIV, an ESV, a Holman Christian Standard Bible. Why? So you can understand what you're reading. If you can't understand it, then why read it? Right? It's like reading Chaucer's Tales or I don't know if any of the English teachers in here. Some of those books we had to read that were like, oh, the old, that old King's English. Why in the world do we have to read that stuff? We had to memorize some dumb thing out of that. I don't even remember what it was, but y'all remember what I'm talking about? Y'all know that? Why? Why? Can't even speak it. Didn't even know what I was saying when I was quoting it. Right? 
Know what you're reading. Find a translation. Get a journal. Find something that works for you. Find a devotional guide. Now, here's the kicker about devotional guides. Some of us will get a devotional guide and we forget the Bible. Don't get a devotional guide and read five pages and read one verse of Scripture. So I'm not real keen on devotionals that don't give me a whole lot of Scripture. I don't, I'm not interested, though I love Max Lucado a lot. I love his books. I'm not interested in what Max Lucado says as much as I am what God says. And by the way, Max Lucado would probably agree. So get a journal. Have a translation you can read. You can use. There's all kinds of commentaries you can look at online. So many more resources than we've ever had before in history of resources to help you grow in your walk with the Lord by yourself. Notice the last one's here. We need to pray. Goes without saying you would think we need to pray. That includes, and I stink at this part, listening, being still, and know that I'm God. Psalms 46.10 says that I'm listening for the Lord to speak to my heart. Praying. We spent a whole eight weeks talking about praying. I won't go there, but we know there. We need to memorize scripture and learn to practice the presence of God. What I mean by that is that we don't just have a daily quiet time with the Lord, and then we never think about God the rest of the day. So as we're going throughout the day, are we thinking about the scriptures that we learned that morning, that we, God spoke to us? So sometimes for me to remember that, even from like 11 o'clock, from 5 o'clock, I need to know post-it note or have my journal with me to go back and look at what I read. Setting maybe some times aside throughout your day, maybe every couple of hours, you come back for just three minutes and reread what you wrote in your journal so that you're reminding yourself that you're in the presence of God all day long. Not just a Sunday, not just a Wednesday night, not even just a morning time but practicing the presence of God. There's a great book written about that very thing. You can Google that and find that. Notice these last three. These go without saying, but let me say them quickly. A daily family worship time. Not only a daily quiet time alone with you, but with your family. And if you don't have family, then you cover it in your daily quiet time. But if you have kids, if you have grandkids in your house, a daily family time with the Lord. Now, I say daily. Sometimes in our family, you know it's hard to do it on some occasions. And so it kind of works against you. But you set aside time to worship together. And we say that some people go, oh my goodness, I can't sing. You don't have to sing, but a time to read the word of God together and talk about what this means in your life so that you are teaching your children when they become teenagers, they know how to have a walk with the Lord by themselves. They don't need you to babysit them or hold their hand. They understand. So when Chris gets them in the seventh grade, I pray they already know how to have a quiet time. That you've already shown them what to do. You've shown them your journal. You've shown them how to write out those things and apply scripture to their lives. In those conversations in the car that you're talking about the principles of the word of God. Now, we give you some resources for our kids, very specific and very easy ways to do that. Now, a lot, a lot of folks don't do these, but I'm going to encourage you to do these. If you have a preschooler, when you go back there today, ask for, if they don't give it to you, once a week they give you a, what's called a parent cue in week number one, two, three, and four. It'll tell you what they're talking about in their class well, my child's only two and a half. What difference does it make? Ask them these questions. Talk to them about what they're learning. So it says about their basic truths, and these are every week. God made me. God loves me. Jesus wants to be my friend forever. The key question to ask them this month is, who loves you? The bottom line is God loves you. Gives you a verse that you can work with him through, and even some times to talk about when you get up in the morning. Folks, you think it doesn't matter when they're two and a half? You go look at every... Ex, ex, expert in education, everyone will tell you the first five years of your child's life are the single most important moments in their brain development, their physical, social, and emotional well-being starts in the first five years of their life. After that, it's gravy. Are you with me? And so what do I want to fill my kid's heart and mind with? Why do I have them here at nine o'clock in the morning when I could sleep in? Because I want to be filled with the word of God. And that's what our teachers teach back then. We're not babysitting preschoolers, right, Karen Fordham? We're not babysitting them. Now, if they're one, we are babysitting them. But even then, we've got Christian music playing in the background. Hopefully, they can share Bible stories with them as they're holding them and loving them, right? For kids, for grades K through 5, we have what's called a God time. Every single week, and these don't take very long. We do this in our house in the mornings before school. Works for us. May not work for you, but works for us, right? Very simple. A paragraph, something you can do, an activity you can do with them, scripture that you can read. You go over the memory verse they're reading. There's a, there's a thing here. There's a parental cue for kids that gives you bottom lines, the stories that they're learning on Sunday morning, right? So we sit at lunch today. The first question we're going to ask our kids, and they know it, and they get so excited about it, they can hardly wait, right? What did you learn today in 252? And always, typically, Denise, we're going to learn about the game they played first. That's typically what rolls out first, right? And what that game had to do with your Bible story. 
Why do I want to do that? Because I want to reinforce what they're learning. I, I want to know what they're learning so I can encourage them and help them get and grasp the Word of God and apply it to their lives. So we try to make it as simple for you. You can go even deeper in this. They have videos. There's all kinds of things you can do that go along with our morning curriculum. So let me say unashamedly, get your kids... Moms and dads, listen to me. You do a lot of things for them, and I encourage you and challenge and, and applaud you for doing them. But if you are not getting your kids here at 9 o'clock, they are missing a huge opportunity to grow. Get them here. Well, I don't really know what group I'm going to be in. I don't know. That's the next one, weekly wife, wife group. Well, then we'll, find, we'll help you find one. Do a daily family devotional. Get a family devotional. Read through the scripture together. Whatever you can do together, pray with them. And if you don't, my kids, they'll let you know before you go to bed. You didn't pray with us, right? Okay, I didn't. That's terrible. I hate when they do that. Notice these last two and we're done. A weekly life group. A weekly life group. What, what am I talking about? Well, in the building this morning, I don't know how many we got this morning. How many we got? Did we count it yet? We know. 302, 304, 324. That's good. I was trying to read this hieroglyphics quickly. 324, right? I promise you we didn't have maybe 200 in life groups. We have about 125 of you that have, don't darken a life group. Let me encourage you. Life groups are back in session. We never really let out over the summer, but for some of you, it's back in session. Get in a small group Bible study. Why? Because you're not connected if you're not, and you can't grow deeper if you're not. Listen, if all you do is come to worship, you are only a part. You are only attending a church. You're not a part of one. We talked about life groups extensively last week for to be a connection point. It's also a growth point. You may learn something from somebody else who asks a question. You may have an opportunity to bless somebody else who's growing, who maybe not is as mature in Christ as you are, and you can help them and encourage them. And somebody above you can do the same for you. Right? We've got to grow together in a weekly life group. Your kids need it. Your students need it. Well, it's not that important. I mean, I get the preaching. Listen to me. If I had to choose for you to attend something in the morning, and I don't, I mean this completely. I would rather you go to a life group than sit in here. That's the truth. You're going, are you kidding me? I'm not. I'm really not. I'd rather you be in connected to a life group for your students to be connected to a life group, for your kids to be connected to a life group, especially for kids because it's on their level. This right here a lot of times shoots over their heads. We try to keep it down their level, but sometimes it's going to shoot over their head. In there it will not. Wednesday nights it will not. So get here and be connected to a life group. You're missing out. And when you do, prepare. If you have a Bible study you're going through, so for example, on September 11th, we'll start a brand new series. You'll get a curriculum that you can take home with you and do every week. Let me give you an encouraging word. Get on with it. Do it. Men, let me give you a word. I'll let my wife get the book and fill me in. I don't read. Now, men, we all know that's a lie. Ladies, is that true? Because every man reads at least one time a day. Let's just keep it real, right? Whenever you got to read it, read it. Prepare yourself. Come ready to learn and listen and share what God is doing in your life. Well, it's really not anybody's business what, what's happening in my life. That's the mentality that makes a church never grow because it's always on the surface. Some people, listen, I've met people. People start sharing gut level stuff and there are people who go, oh my gosh. Oh, I've got to find another life group. I can't deal with this. I don't want to know about other people's stuff. Listen, listen to me. Life sometimes is messy. Thank you, Russ was with me. Let me say it. Let me try that one more time. Maybe your life is perfect, but mine sometimes is messy. Is yours messy from time to time? Absolutely it is. You know that it is. The question is, what do we do about that messiness? Do we smile and act like we don't have any messiness? Do we smile and act like everything's perfectly fine? Or do we come into this place and get connected to a life group and say, I'm struggling. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have this physical issue. I have this marriage issue. I have these things with my kids. I don't know what to do. Somebody's got to help me. My marriage is on the rocks. Well, I don't think I could ever say that. I mean, that's just, what if someone... Why not? What a better place to do it than right here. If you can't do it here, where will you do it? Well, I just need to kind of figure it out on my own. You do? That's part of the process. But you know what chances are? Somebody's had the same marriage problem you've had. Somebody's had the same problem with their kids that they've had. And they can say those magical words, I know how you feel. And I survived. <laughs> and so can you. I always want to be as vulnerable, as transparent with you as I possibly can be. This preacher does not have it all together. Our family sometimes is a hot mess. 
right? Preacher's not perfect. Preacher gets mad and yells and gets frustrated and aggravated. My wife, she's perfect. She doesn't do much wrong at all. You get the idea. You got to be connected. You got to grow in that life group. A daily time alone with the Lord. A, a time with your family worship. A weekly life group. And lastly, a weekly worship experience. I love to put a weekly worship experience says, plural. But when you come to worship, do you come prepared for worship? I promise you, if you go to work tomorrow, when you walk in there at 8 o'clock, you don't walk in and run in the door, hopefully. <laughs> At 8.30, you're supposed to be at 8 o'clock. Run the door and go, oh my gosh, I haven't thought about work all day. I don't know what I'm going to do today. You know what you've done? You've all the way to work. You've been thinking, what do I got to do? What am I, what, what's my job so I can do this week? Listen to me carefully. If you can do that for your job, what would happen if you do that spiritually? So that when you walk in this store, you're not running in with your tongue hanging out at 10.45. You're coming in early at 9 o'clock for life groups, right? 8.45 for life group, right? And you're coming prepared to worship. You've already worshipped the Lord on your own before you got in this building, and you came prepared and ready to worship. If every believer did that, folk, this place, the roof would come off of this place. I'm telling you. Come prepared for worship. Your heart, your mind ready. Participate in worship. That's my favorite thing. Man, I'm just going to get you good today. I don't like singing. I'm, now, I'm glad that God's love is not based on me for who I am or what I do or I don't do. God loves me either way, but God wants me to be a part of worship. Listen, I do not want to go to the Worship Remedial 101 class when I get to heaven. I want to join the choir from day one. I don't have to go, God, well, God, I don't know if you know or not, but that, that song is not in the Baptist hymnal. <laughs> God, that's a little loud. I just don't know if you know that or not. That's a little... That distracts him. That's a little bit. Mm. God, I don't sing. That's why God put in the Bible, make a joyful noise. Well, somebody might hear me. And here's my great biblical response. So? Participate in worship. Sing, pray, listen, and respond. Use the message notes. I promise you I don't put these outlines together because, again, I can't think of anything else better to do. I need to occupy my time so that y'all think I do something for, for a living, that I actually work besides Sunday and Wednesdays. I really do it so you'll have it for the week. I hope you take that and you, sh- and you put it in your Bible and you refer to it during the week. Now, I know the vast majority of you do not because most of them are left here at the sanctuary on a weekly basis, but I hope a few of you... I'm just keeping it real. I hope a few of you take it home and look at it and digest it. I usually, not as much today, but a lot of times a lot more notes than what I can even get to. I hope you use those. I'd put those on there for you so you can use them. They'll be of help to you. Apply the truths you've learned. James says, don't be a hearer of the word, but a what? Doer of the word. Hey, well, preacher, how do you know if you feel like you've been a success? Here's how I know. If my people that I'm called to shepherd, more and more of them are learning to connect, grow, commit, and go. And they're applying the truths of God in their daily lives. And they're growing to be more like Jesus. And they're getting connected to a life group. And they don't make excuses. And they're they're, they're discontent with being over here when God wants them over here. All the joy to to walk with people who are over here. And and I love walking with these folks. I love walking with all of you. Listen to me, Carol. That's a shepherd's job. Great joy when the one comes home, but also a great joy to see the 99 walking with Jesus. What's my word for you today? Let's get on with it. Would you pray with me?